Hello, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And uh, today, we're joined by somebody who needs no introduction. I'm sure many of you know Brian Kilmey, who's been with Fox News since 1997 and uh, has been host of Fox and Friends, which has been a top uh, morning cable show since 2000. He also hosts a nationally syndicated radio show, The Brian Kilmeade Show. I've joined him a number of times on that. And uh, also hosts One Nation with Brian Kilmeade and What Made America Great on Fox Nation. Obviously, he doesn't get any sleep. <laughs> he's the busiest person at Fox. And uh, he's also a best-selling author. Today, we're going to be talking to him about his new book, which is called Teddy and Booker T, How Two American Icons Blazed a Path of Racial Equality. And uh, I'm excited to have you on the show today, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm honored to be on. Are you kidding? Uh, by the way, Booker T reminds me, although he did an education, you did it in, in the medical profession as a brain surgeon, uh, and then, of course, in government. But what Booker T watched, he was able to overcome uh, to do what he did. I was yeah. just in awe of, and I would love to talk to you about it, let alone be interviewed by you. It's a thrill. Well, thank you. That was one of the first books I read, Up From Slavery, by yep. Booker T. Washington. It was very, very important to me. Now, um, what made you focus on these two men? It's very unlikely friendship between the president and Booker T. Washington during Jim Crow times. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to pick up where President of Freedom Fighter left off. So Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass in the battle to save America's soul, which brought us uh, into the Civil War and through it. Uh, sadly, the assassination of John Wilkes Booth stopped that relationship from being one of the most promising in our history. But when it, when it lasted, it was certainly important. But I wanted to say, where do I pick off where I left off there? And then how do I go forward? And I saw a link to both men. I saw Teddy Roosevelt, six years old, spotted in the third floor of a window in Manhattan, when the body of Abraham Lincoln comes by. And then I see Frederick Douglass, photos from Tuskegee, showing me him speaking at Tuskegee, a university, uh, university that uh, Booker T. Washington founded. And I go, there's my link. You know, now I got a direct link. Then I went to the, the, uh, the more I researched Booker T. Washington, the more I saw how he felt about Teddy Roosevelt and the role he played. So I went to the Roosevelt family and I say, am I overstating this? And they said, absolutely not. We would love to help you any way possible. We would like to talk more about that relationship beyond that famous dinner that they had in the middle of Jim Crow era in this country. It was not OK in certain areas of the South for a black man to have dinner with the president's family, let alone the president of the United States. So people just think about that. And I said, well, what led up to that? What did they do after that? And that was my focus, how these two men looked at impossible circumstances at a different time in our our country, loved the country, and just wanted to make it better. And I thought, man, do I envy that mindset? Well, can you can you bring us up to speed on what uh, Teddy Roosevelt's early life was like, his childhood, and how to get interested in health and all these various things? I mean, he was a very interesting character. Fascinating. And uh, outside Lincoln, he's the most written about president that we've had. A lot of people don't like him. Even Republicans don't like him. But because he mixes everything up, you know, he takes on uh, corporate entities. He is an environmentalist. Uh, you know, he was for the little guy. Now that is more the Republican Party of today. But what I think attracted them to each other is the circumstances they grew up in. Obviously, growing up a slave, worst thing you can imagine. Nothing good about it. None understood. But with Teddy Roosevelt, people say, Brian, what a reach. He's got seven generations of wealth. He grows up wealthy. He's got a mom and a dad. You know, Booker T. Washington never knew his dad. His mom was working 18 hours a day as a slave. The guy had no shoes uh, and, and that didn't know how to read or write. Never knew his father, as I mentioned, or his birthday. Well, the thing that kind of grounded them both together is health. And Teddy Roosevelt didn't have it. He had bad asthma back then. Parents would just sit there and stare and hope their son or daughter would make the next breath. They used to do things like blowing cigar smoke in their face or give them a bottle of hard liquor because they thought that would open up the, uh, the bronchial tubes. And then we know how uh, stupid that sounds. Also, he had a problem with his internal intestines. They think it's cholera of the intestines. 
So this guy was always in pain, had to be homeschooled, had no friends, was constantly bullied when he went out. The first formal schooling he had, and he got a great education, by the way, but the first formal schooling he had was Harvard. And and to me, uh, Dr. Carson, you would know better because you meet so many people that stare death in the face in the job that you do. But my sense is the reason why he lived every day so fulfilled as it was, read, read and wrote, wrote books at the pace in which he did, is because he knew what it was like to not know if you're going to take another breath and to have people around him in tears thinking, what's going to happen to my son, my daughter, my, my brother? And when you grow up like that, even though you have money, it gives you a sense that life, you got to live life in a hurry. But he was determined, wasn't he, to get his health into good shape. I mean, he went through some pretty vigorous things to become a leader of the Rough Riders. So his dad said to him, you have a great mind, you got a terrible body, you got to build it up. And as he traveled around and kind of grew out of his asthma and his intestinal uh, problems, he became a, a rugged, uh, what we would call a, a fitness guru. And his dad saw his determination and bought him some weights. He brought that right up to, into Harvard. He was on the boxing team. Uh, he was always engaged in some type of martial arts. Uh, you know, when he was out there testing himself in the open terrain, when he lost his mother, when he lost his mother and his wife on the same day, he went out into the tundra of what we now know as North Dakota and worked with ranchers on a daily basis, slept on the floor, and, and was well, they used to mock him because he had to wear glasses, but he quickly earned their respect. So he was just the opposite of how he grew up, which is another life lesson. It's incredible when you think about uh, how fit he became when he started out unfit and how energetic he was. But uh, what about what, what drew him into politics and, and the Spanish-American War? Well, you know, the thing is, he got involved in local New York state politics. He started to sit there and study the whole thing and find out the whole uh, pathway to power. He was fascinated by it, would never subscribe to it or kiss the ring. But he had a few mentors along the way. He felt as though he could make a difference, enjoy the speaking aspect and interacting with people, which is pretty amazing, too. When we always have this perception of uh, people with a lot of money who hang out with people with a lot of money, they don't they look down on people without a lot of money. And he was just the opposite. He was so comfortable with people who are living day to day to try to earn a living and he was determined to make their lives better. Reminds me a little of you and why you got into this. You certainly didn't need the rough and tumble world of politics. Uh, but you say, how can I make the country better? And that's what he did. He started making his name, too, when he started uh, working hard for some presidential candidates, got some prominent positions. And then we started making a name for himself by just overachieving on everything. Finally named assistant secretary of the Navy. Uh, prior to that, he wore he wrote a book that's esteemed still today on the on the naval battles of the War of 1812. His uncles helped him through that, who, by the way, fought for the Confederacy and got the vernacular down, had to let him know that these are the terms we use and these are the battles that we fought. And he got a real name for himself. And as the sister secretary of the Navy, he was more active than the secretary. And when word came out that it looks like the Spanish War was going to uh, kick off. He wanted, to, he wanted to take that opportunity to go in there and join the military because his dad always regretted that he didn't fight in the Civil War. He gave in to his mom's urgings. To, I don't want you fighting against my family. My family's from the South. Please don't do it. And he said that he wanted to do what his dad didn't do. And he saw how his dad was tortured by it. So he went in as a colonel, fought with great valor and vigor, and became out a hero, short story, long story short, goes to Montauk, Long Island, through quarantine, and they're visiting him already, saying, run for governor of New York. He does and wins. He was a police commissioner in between, and he makes he turns over so many tables as police co as governor. He doesn't give in to any of the power brokers and the syndicates, and they wanted to get rid of him. And they said, why don't we just have him on the ticket with McKinley? And they basically forced him on McKinley. And he hated the idea, but he couldn't turn down his country if they drafted him. And he did. He got the vice presidency. He's like, I don't know what good this job is. You don't really do anything unless the president gets shot uh, and dies. And then you become the man. And at 42, it became the man. You know, so he became president. But what he did is what you did, Dr. Carson. He read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. He gave a he had a pre-order copy 
and he knew about Booker T. Washington. Then he gave it to his wife, and he said, uh, Teddy, you have to. You have to meet him. And they met April 1st, I think, 1901 in New York City. And they hit it off, which is pretty amazing. You're talking about two people born during the prior to the Civil War, lived through it. You might not imagine what they've been told about the preconceptions of black and white people and what we're all <laughs> capable of. And all they saw was and, uh, so, uh, is accomplishment and potential. And what I think they had in common more than anything else, a uh, belief in the country had to get better and they were the ones to do it. I want to ask you about Booker T. Washington now and uh, his early upbringing. And how did he get the name Washington? He didn't know his father. He didn't know his birthday. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about all that? Yeah, I mean, what he did is, which is pretty amazing, Dr. Carson, I know you you know all this stuff too, is that whenever you think of George Washington, they want to take a statue down now. They're debating on taking it down in New York, which is insane. It's the location of our first president's, uh, president's house, New York City. Uh, it's where he escaped to freedom through Manhattan when he was, his army was almost wiped out in the Battle of Brooklyn. When he knew he couldn't win the war unless he took New York, he put spies in there and then triumphantly came back in and forced the British out. All this stuff happened in New York, and New York is debating whether George Washington is worthy of this wonderful city. Because Jefferson had got to be taken out of the city council. Why? Because they had slaves. They were people of their time. No one's going to excuse it, but it's part of the things that were happening in every continent on the planet. And George Washington, uh, one thing about it is if you think he's not worthy of you, well, back then, the most commonly used name that was selected by freed African-American slaves was Washington. So if they had that view of our founding father, our general, our first president, how dare we in 2024 say that's not right? But he had to pick a last name when they came to him and he picked it uh, and he picked Washington. Also, there was uh, I always get the names backwards. His mom's boyfriend of today would be uh, of that day with Washington Ferguson or Ferguson, Washington. That might have been playing into it, too, as well. But he, you know, he looked up to Washington. The more he read about him, the more he loved the guy. And that's what was taught at Tuskegee, too, about our founding fathers. So uh, that was picked. What I found amazing, Doctor, I don't know if you felt the same way on how you became a brain surgeon and fought your way through medical school and preconceptions about what you were capable of, but he, to me, seemed to be a master of visualization. He seemed to want to manifest education, manifest a better life, pictured himself learning to read and write, pictures himself at college, pictures himself launching a college, and all the things they tell you about, Napoleon Hill, Norman Vincent Peale, Anthony Robbins of today. Zig Ziglar, when they talk about success and overcoming circumstances, he was doing it instinctively. And I just thought like, if Anthony Robbins ever wants to pick up something that might uh, reinforce all the things he's trying to tell those people who come to see him and want to turn around their lives, uh, I would venture to guess that Booker T. Washington probably had it worse than anybody watching us right now. And all he thought about is how to make it better. He never hated anybody. He said, I don't want to give the power of my hatred over to somebody. If you don't like me because of the color of my skin, that's okay. I'm done. I'll deal with the people that don't mind me. And hopefully you'll see me working with them and change your perception. He had that seminary background too. So for a while, I guess he thought about that. But he loved, um, as just like Donald Trump loves the Bible. And uh, he loved to read it. And he got life lessons in it. But everything that he did and the people that he met, he used his... He used his position next to power, J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, Julian Rose, Julius Rosenwald, and he just used it to make Tuskegee better and life for African Americans in the South better, which he is was, just awe inspiring. It was totally awe inspiring, and he reminds me so much of my mother, who, if anybody was a victim, she was, but she would never accept that label. And she was convinced that education was the way out. And uh, there were a lot of things going on when I was a kid that we would find abhorrent today. But she would say, forget about all that stuff and just educate yourself. And her friends were always saying, your boys are going to grow up, they're going to hate you because you make them stay in the house and read books. And I would overhear them and I'd say, you know, they're right, mother, but we had to do it anyway. 
And uh, <laughs> I think she had the last laugh because one son became a brain surgeon and the other became a rocket scientist. So, Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, has. I think you guys did all right. <laughs> uh, I also, I thought it was interesting, uh, you know, I, I thought it was your story too. Is it, is it true your mom couldn't read or write? That's correct. She was functionally illiterate, but she was very clever and she was able to hide it very successfully. And she did eventually teach herself to read. She got her GED the same year that I graduated from high school. She got her GED. She went on to college in 1994, got an honorary doctorate degree. So she was Dr. Carson, too. That's oh wow. That is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's just it. We, I don't think uh, anyone denies Jim Crow. Uh, that's not, uh, no, no one denies the evil of slavery. No one denies that there were poll taxes and people and blacks were threatened not to go to the, not to go to uh, the voting booth or else your house will burn down. Your relatives will die. I get it. We're not ducking American history. You can still love the country. Point out where we were, how we got through it and how we're better for it. And the thing about our country, in my humble opinion, is is not that we're perfect. What makes us great is that we try to be and we hold ourselves to that standard. I don't want to ban any books from Booker T. Washington. I don't want to pretend that slavery was okay. Ron DeSantis didn't finish his statement two months ago. When he said when people emerged from slavery, they had skills. He wasn't saying it was good. He was saying it was fact. He's saying they could build a house. They could work in the fields. They could work agriculturals. You know, they could work with wood. They, they had, uh, everybody had a trade. And you know who didn't forget that? Booker T. Washington. You could not graduate from Tuskegee without learning a trade. And the parents of first-generation previous slaves, newly freed slaves, were angry at him. I didn't have my kid. Uh, I don't want my kid working with his or her hands. No, no. America wasn't ready to hire you. So you have to be indispensable. Learn a trade and b grow your mind. And that's what Mike Rowe talks about today because we forgot how to do that. He also pointed out, too, uh, and Frederick Douglass did as well, that when, when African-Americans were freed, when blacks were freed, they left behind white people who didn't know how to do anything. They couldn't fix their house, put a window in, put a, hang a door, nothing. And that was a learned moment for them. Say, whatever I do, my next generation is not going to be helpless like that. Right. Well, I had many wonderful memories of Tuskegee University uh, visiting there. One of my first honorary doctorate degrees was from there. And wow. to see the legacy of uh, Booker T. Washington was extremely meaningful to me. But he must have had some critics uh, in his rise to national prominence. What, what were they criticizing? W.E.B. Du Bois, I think you know this better, and you're probably experiencing some of it. Uh, a lot of people tell me, yeah, Booker T. Washington of the black community doesn't have a lot of, uh, doesn't have a lot of prestige right now because they don't like the message of overcoming. They look at him as an accommodator. He knew how wrong everything was. He wasn't making dramatic stands and dramatic marches or shutting down bridges or anything like that. What he'd do is go in there and deal with the life in which he was dealing with in the South. He knew he could only do so much. And his, mo his part was to keep Tuskegee solvent and thriving. And about 1,100 to 1,500 graduates a year will go into the workforce, highly trained, often becoming teachers as part of the deal. And what Booker T. Washington was looked at by critics as somebody that was too accommodating to whites. He wasn't demanding enough for equality. And what I think he was, he was a pragmatist. He was a practical guy. He knew he was talking to people uh, in the North, in many cases that had no problem with race. But he had his college in Alabama. And many of them grew up with generations of thinking there were different between blacks and whites. And whites were better than blacks. So he said, how do I change that? What good would it do? to call the cops or cause attention or write inflammatory columns and then maybe have them take it out in Tuskegee? Or do I change things as by, I educate a generation after generation? And the contrast was W.B. Du Bois. I put it in the book. I don't duck it. And he was the first PH black uh, PhD, had a big European background and thought that Booker T. Washington was basically a sellout. And a lot of people agree today with W.B. E. Du Bois as is pointed out by me, by Bob Woodson and others, he said, look, he said, look at the legacy of Booker T. Washington. The generations of graduates, a curriculum that works, that's picked up in other continents around the country. Uh, he changed people's lives, not by words or letters, 
but by actually doing, building a college, growing mm-hmm. a historically black college syndicate uh, along the way. That's the legacy I want. I respect both schools of thought. Uh, I, 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 everything WB Du Bois wasn't exaggerating. Sure. Things were unequal and they were raw and they were wrong in some sections of our country. But there were still a lot of great people trying to make it better. And I just don't know how proactive he was, even though I think he outlived Booker T. Washington by about 30 years. Well, Booker T. Washington uh, was a person who had perspective. You know, he could see the big picture. And uh, he understood, you know, history. He understood, for instance, uh, in slavery, uh, one of the ways that in places like Mississippi and Alabama, where there might have been more slaves than there were owners, how did you keep them under control? You tell the slaves that are in the house that they're better than the ones in the yard. The ones in the yard, they're better than the ones in the field. And you keep them fighting each other. And then later on, after slavery was over, you teach the light-skinned ones that they're better than the medium-skinned ones, who are better than the dark-skinned ones, and you keep them fighting. And and it just keeps going. Today, you tell the the liberals that the conservative blacks are their enemies, and you keep them at each other's throat. As long as you keep them separated and fighting each other, you have them under control. And most people don't realize that it's been... Uh, one particular party that has been guilty uh, mostly of that. The Republican Party actually was founded uh, as an abolitionist party, and they were very important uh, to Booker T and others in their pursuit of real freedom. So I think it's uh, just a a really fascinating uh, topic to get involved in. But... uh, what about the first meeting between Booker T. Washington and Teddy Roosevelt? How, how did that occur, and what were the ramifications? Well, uh, when they said, when can we meet, after, after he read Up From Slavery, uh, they said, when can we meet? Uh, I just am fascinated by your story. You're an inspiration. Uh, and his wife was also just as invested, his second wife, obviously. Uh, and they meet downtown in New York City, and they say, how can we work together? He said, well, the first thing we got to do is, why don't you come down and visit me in Tuskegee? He goes, that sounds great. And then McKinley gets shot. He dies. And he writes a letter. And we got the letter. I'm saying, I really apologize. I know I promised you to go to Tuskegee, but now I'm president. So I'm going to have to delay the trip. But when you come to town, I'd love to meet with you. And basically signed him up as a, an advisor when it comes to judges, postmasters, uh, dock workers, every, every significant position. And one of the things he said is, is I don't really need to know what color the person's skin is, or, or what else about them. I just need the best person for the job. Man, wouldn't we love that in this Democratic administration? You know, you wouldn't have them protesting in front of your own White House, your own staff. You wouldn't have a guy stealing luggage uh, who's supposed to be working on a nuclear program uh, because he wasn't background check because he checked certain boxes. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt put in writing exactly the country, the way in which we want our country approached. Just give me the best person. And he pointed uh, Minnie Dixon uh, as postmaster, and there was huge pushback. It became a high-paying, prestigious position. They go, okay, good. This is a prestigious uh, position. We need a white person in there. And he said, absolutely not. You're going to keep her. And he went to fight for her. And he did that over and over again. And look, there were times when Teddy Roosevelt some, said some things that showed he had blind spot when it came to race, that showed he had a mom that was born in deep south in the Confederacy with two sons, two brothers that fought for the South. Absolutely. When you worship your parents and they have these beliefs, you are going to internalize those beliefs. But just like all of us hope to do, don't we evolve? I mean, you talked about to me one time that you're here. You are this thriving career and you just want to meet other important people to find out what they thought about important things. And you invite them over to your house because you're always learning. You didn't say I'm a brain surgeon, world renowned. They did movies on my life and uh, readers digest stories on my hands. You said I got to keep improving. I mean, why don't we look at Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt the same way? People go, well, you know, Lincoln said some things. He wants everyone to be free, but he thought blacks, whites were better than blacks. And he did. Okay, understood. But I would argue, even though he didn't have a chance to write his biography, by the time he was uh, uh, done with his, he started his second term, he had evolved on those thoughts. And spending quality time with Frederick Douglass, inviting him up to inaugural ball and saying there's nobody else whose opinion I value more. You don't make that up. 
Uh, there's a reason why he was called honest Abe. You don't cut. You don't say that with all your heart if you believe that there was a difference between the races. Yes. And if we can all evolve, or if these we evolve, hopefully, why can't our great our, our great leaders of the past evolve? Well, I wish I could take that that little soliloquy you just did and uh, have everybody listen to it because that's what we need in our country right now. We need leadership. We need optimism. And we need people who help us to recognize that we are not enemies. You know, America is consistent of neighbors and friends and colleagues and co-workers and most of all, fellow Americans. We need to get back to that once again because that sense of community was what gave us a foundation that allowed us to rise from a ragtag bunch of militiamen to the most powerful nation in the world. And when we destroy that sense of community, we will destroy that foundation. How did Roosevelt react to the criticisms that he got for associating with Booker T. Washington? Yeah, I mean, having him over for dinner is what everyone talks about. In the special on Fox Nation, that aired on our channel. I ended with John McCain in 2008, uh, showing, you know, you know how to, you have to learn how to lose in this country. And John McCain knew that. He lost to Barack Obama. And he said, well, what a far, look how far America has come. There was a time when Booker T. Washington was invited to the White House and created a national scandal. Now a African-American will be hosting that uh, dinner at the White House. Look at how far we've come, if I could just paraphrase it. But that was roughly the spirit in which he spoke. So, when that happened and they got so much blowback because they weren't hiding anything. Booker T. Washington was coming to the White House, signed the guest book, come in. A reporter comes in and says, Booker T. Washington in a dinner at the White House with the president's family? Put it in uh, the paper. It spread like wildfire, became a national scandal that he had sold out our country and created great equality. And it's going to have a, a huge problem with African-Americans who think they could do anything in this country now. That was the feeling of most of the country. But for that section of those subscribers to that newspaper or, or that magazine, uh, they thought it was just a terrible time. So they both had to bring their relationship a little bit more low profile, made sure that they knew that they had to not antagonize a country that was evolving, but hasn't arrived where we're at in 2024. We can, we, we're abhorred by that statement that I just made about the realities of those times. We should be. Got it. Doesn't mean every American felt that way. So what they would do is, hey, when you come to the White House, come at 10. How about at 4 o'clock? Let's not even get into that situation where you're having dinner over or we're being provocative to clearly bigoted people who haven't evolved with their race relations. But they still were extremely tight. In fact, he helped, um, you know, he was somebody who would be advising him on everything that's going on in the South. He would help him win uh, re-election by uh, essentially endorsing him. But what was so interesting is, they both knew they could only do so much. They would help each other, but they don't have to take all each other's advice. There was a time when the rubber hit the road between them, the controversy with the Buffalo soldiers, uh, when the Buffalo soldiers were wrongly accused of uh, uh, crimes, and he basically fired all of them and took their pensions, which was crazy because he fought with them and knew how gallantly they fought in, uh, in Cuba. And Booker T. Washington says, Mr. President, you got it all wrong. You're on the wrong side in this. Trust me, the, you know me. These guys did not do wrong. These people in Oklahoma, they pinned him on something that didn't really belong, and he didn't go with it. Another time when Teddy Roosevelt makes a comeback and wants to get the Republican nomination and doesn't, so runs on his own platform against Taft and against Woodrow Wilson, he said, Booker, I need your endorsement here to deliver the black vote. He said, I can't, because if you lose, I'll lose access to the White House. And what I, I right now have to do what's best for Tuskegee. I can't do that. And he said, I understand. So the friendship was transactional. It was respectful, but it was transactional. They both knew that they would benefit from the relationship while also having great respect for each other about the circumstances in which they were. And I got countless quotes in the book about Booker T. Washington talking about what a great man he is. And he said, one man, if I could just paraphrase, no one has done more for African Ameri uh, for blacks in America uh, since uh, Lincoln than Teddy Roosevelt. That's I mean, not my words. That's yeah. Booker T. Washington's words. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure they had a lot of disagreements, but they were still able to work together. C 
couldn't yeah. we couldn't we learn from that? You know, it's it's very interesting. You know, when you look back over politics in, in our country and you see how divided we are uh, right now. Even though you could probably take the most radical left wing person and the most radical right wing person, and they probably agree on ninety percent of stuff, but we take that ten percent that they don't agree on, and we massage it and water it and try to make it into a big deal. And we have people actually hating each other because they have different yard signs. And uh, it's going to require some some very skillful leadership to get us through that. But I, I think we can learn something from the relationship between Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, uh, coming from very different perspectives, but being able to, to meaningfully work together. And what do you think were some of the results of that relationship? Uh, number one, Booker T. Washington wanted uh, Teddy Roosevelt to speak at his, at his graduation. He got it. Not only that, Teddy Roosevelt served at the board of Tuskegee. So think about this. A guy born in the North to great wealth is down in the South in Alabama, seeing the segregated South up close and personal and seeing for himself there's no difference between the races. Look at these graduates. I mean, he was almost giddy with an ad lib speech prior to the speech he was supposed to give because he could not believe it. Because what Booker T. Washington learned besides the books was he lost his accent, which took me about five years to lose my New York accent, maybe even more. So he said he learned um, to sit up, stand up straight, to make eye contact, to have a firm grip, the basics of hygiene, all these things that people say, look at how cruel, look how pri uh, primitive. No, it was all about upbringing and opportunity. And he proved that. And you could see, can you imagine how many other people were converted just by looking at Tuskegee and Hampton College in action? And say, well, I don't know what my parents told me, but they are wrong. I'm looking at these guys and these women, by the way, who not only taught school, they also went to school and they all learned a skill, uh, a little bit more traditional type skills, but they all learned a trade too. And they said, I got to throw that in the street. So that's what they learned from each other. Also, I imagine Booker T. Washington learned that uh, there's a lot of great attributes in people that, you know, even though he was a slave until he was nine years old, and you might think I'm a little bit angry about blacks and whites. When you meet some powerful people who want to give you money to to support your cause, it's hard to think that uh, all white people are bad and evil and hard to believe that rich people are self-centered uh, and only want to share their money with other wealthy people when all they wanted to do was give it to him. I thought it was pretty amazing, too, that they all pulled their money together to force him to take a vacation. He did not want to take a vacation. And finally, they said, listen, you have to. And they said they sent him overseas and he was able to found out that he was well known over there, too. Gave some great speeches and learned a lot about the culture. And then he came back. Same thing with Tay Roosevelt. When he traveled around, got a good perspective on what America has to do, where we've been and how lucky we are to be here. Mm -hmm. So they got together a lot of legislation and issues that matter most. But they were both very practical. They knew certain things were wrong, but they also knew the limits of what they could do. We mm -hmm. don't have a king here. Right. You know, we 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 got we have to do things through a process. Sounds a lot like you. Yes, I <laughs> I don't have a king. Yeah, I we got to just take our time and work our way through the process. Well, let me just ask you in closing, um, what would you like people to get from this book? Perspective, perspective of how far we've come as a country, uh, a reality that I'm not trying to soft pedal anything about Jim Crow that slavery was just bad, not really, but no, it was really bad. And Jim Crow was evil. And the compromise of 1877 was because our electoral process had not been put back together again. We couldn't pick a president. So the deal they cut was detrimental to America's growth in 1877. It gave us Rutherford B. Hayes and gave the South an opportunity. Sadly, they took it to go backwards in time. And the people that brought us through that time and put us back on the, on the treadmill to success are people, not only them, but people like Booker T. Washington and Teddy Roosevelt. I believe that if you have perspective on where the world was and what our country was doing in the previous century and the century prior, especially as we come up on our 250th birthday, you'd be less critical and more understanding about what we're at, where we're at today and more in awe of those people that came before us. Uh, Dr. Carson, I believe we have to win the war in history if we're ever going to move forward. I used to think that our enemies from the outside trying to diminish American success I never thought it would come from the inside. I believe we're coming out of this self-loathing period, but I think we just got to push it forward by telling the true story 
of America's past. Not perfect, but what makes us great is we try to be. No question about it. You know, our, our history gives us our identity, which gives us our beliefs. Right. And, uh, and pride. You have uh, made a tremendous contribution. You continue to make great contributions. And I'm very grateful that God has put you in this country. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for your time, Dr. Carson. I hope to see you soon. And maybe back uh, serving the the president in the White House. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) Well, thanks to Brian Kilmeade for that fascinating uh, interview about his new book, Teddy and Booker T. I hope that you can see how people with different backgrounds and different views can still come together to do very positive things. Even way back in Jim Crow days, look at the relationship that was able to be developed between Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington and the good that it did in opening things up in our country. And we all need to recognize that we are not enemies. Wayne, we are not enemies. That is really the key to the future, to a positive future for this country. We can't allow ourselves to be torn apart by ideology. And it's okay to disagree. I always say if two people agree about everything, one of them isn't necessary. And we're all necessary to make this into a great country. So think about that as your prescription for this week. How can you make sure that people that you normally don't talk to, don't even look at, that they know that they're not your enemy? Try some kindness. You'll actually find that you'll want to do it more than just this week when you see the results. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Please subscribe for free on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify. Rate us, review us. Tell your friends and neighbors. We have to do everything we can to spread common sense and remember what the foundations of our nation were. Faith. Liberty. Community and life. See you next week.